1 Corinthians 9, 22 to 27. To those who are weak, I became weak so I could win the weak. I have become all things to all people so I could save some of them in any way possible. I do all this for the gospel's sake so I can share in its blessings. You know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. So run to win. All those who compete in the games use self-control so they can win a crown. That crown is an earthly thing that lasts only a short time, but our crown will never be destroyed. So I do not run without a goal. I fight like a boxer who is hitting something, not just the air. I treat my body hard and make it my slave so that I myself will not be disqualified after I have preached to others. You have kids or grandkids, you know that they could get into a big mess really, really fast. And uh, that's what the church in Corinth had gotten themselves into. Uh, in one sense, they were baby Christians. They had not been believers for a long time. And so you had this whole church that was full of problems. It was a mess. But it was a beautiful mess uh, because God loved them and the Apostle Paul loved them. And the book of 1 Corinthians is Paul's attempt to help them uh, kind of sort through the problems that they had. They had personality issues. Uh, they, had, they were suing each other. They had selfish issues. They had sexual issues. There were some things that were going on within the church that were completely inappropriate. And we're looking right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 9, and 10 at what I just call the gray areas. One of the problems, and it was a leading issue, not just in Corinth, but we find out also in the church at Rome, and I'm sure in a lot of places, is they were eating meat that had been offered to idols. Uh, we don't have idol worship as far as actual idols, but what happened, a little bit of, a little bit of uh, friction there, but uh, they had idols. As a matter of fact, of Aphrodite and Apollos were two really big idols that were in the city of Corinth. And so people that would worship them would, would take an animal and sacrifice it and would have a feast right there in the temple grounds. And then the priests would take that meat, what was ever left over, and they would sell it in the marketplace for a discounted price, pretty much. So then people would buy it, and they would have meat. Well, some of the Christians felt that it was wrong. Because it had been in an idol worship service, and we shouldn't eat that kind of meat. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and just this is a little bit of review, Paul says, you know what, it, it doesn't matter, because Apollos is not really a god. Aphrodite is not really, there aren't any other gods. There's only one god. And so when people give a, a sacrifice to this false god, there's not really a god, so it really doesn't matter. Meat is meat. Wherever it comes from, you can eat it. But, it, but he said, but if it's going to hurt somebody else, if you eating that meat is going to bother somebody else, you know what? It is best that you not eat it. So he deals with this one particular gray issue that you know what? It's okay, but you know what? For the sake of somebody else, it's even better that you don't. We talked a little bit about some of the gray areas that Christians disagree, and I won't get into that, but Christians disagree on a lot of things. But here's the one thing that Christians should not disagree on, and that is we should love each other. We might disagree on entertainment. We might disagree on what we dress, on what we do with our children. We might disagree on what we eat or what we don't. We might disagree on a lot of things, but there's one thing that is black and white in the Bible, and I'm to love my brother and I'm to love my sister, and I should never let that get down. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is going to continue with this, because it's actually 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. He's going to continue with this whole theme of gray areas, but now he's going to give his own personal illustration. He's going to tell his story. He's going to show where he had complete liberty to do something, but he chose not to. As a matter of fact, what it is is he could have taken a salary. 
He could have taken a paycheck. He could have taken wages. He could have been paid by the church in Corinth. That was his right. But he decided not to. So if you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, what we're going to do is we're going to look, and it's kind of divided into two things. We're going to look and see what gave Paul the right to get paid by the church. And then we're going to look at why he didn't. Why he chose not to. He could have, he, but he exercised his right not to, and why. And even though we're not dealing necessarily in a personal level with wages, we're not, but we are dealing with, when we disagree about some things, you know what, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe there's a reason why we choose not to do something or why we choose to do something. Because here's one, here's one excuse that doesn't fly in, with God's item. Just because I want to. That's a selfish reason. That, you know, that's not a good excuse to God. And so we're going to look at why. So let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to begin in verse 1. He says this, because he's given his personal story. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? That's what partly made him apostle. Are you not my work in the Lord? And if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power or authority or a right to lead and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, which is actually Peter, or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? We'll stop right there because we're going to kind of read little bit by little bit and see if we can explain it. So what Paul is doing is Paul is explaining that he has a right to earn a living. So that's your first point. He has a right to earn a living. And one reason is because he's an apostle. He says, I'm an apostle. Paul even though he at first had blasphemed the Lord, Jesus Christ presented himself to him. He served the Lord. God called him to be an apostle. He says, I'm an apostle, and I have a right to do this. I have a right. I have authority. I can earn a wage. Others do. And actually, he received payment or received money from other churches. But for some reason, the church at Corinth, he decided not to. We're going to find that out here in a little bit. He decided not to take any money from them. And so he, but he had a right. Also, he goes on and he says in verse 7, he gives another reason why. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charge? Who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit thereof? Who feeds a flock and eats not of the milk of the flock? This is by human experience. Human experience. He says, hey, um, you got a soldier? Does a soldier have to pay his way to get to war? No. The government pays his way. A, a, a farmer. You know, he plants a garden, a gardener, he plants a garden. Is he allowed to eat some of the fruit? Well, yeah, it's his garden. He, you know, he worked it. He's, he's allowed to. Well, what, what about another farmer that's got, got cattle and got animals? Is he allowed to drink the milk? Perry's a milk? Is he allowed to go out and get a glass of milk? From the, sure, it's his farm. In other, words, in other words, when you do something, when you serve somewhere, you have a right to be able to take what you have earned, what you have worked for. And that's another reason. He says, you know what? I've worked. I've served for a year and a half in the church in Corinth. I, ha I had a right to be able to take wages and salary from the church. He goes on in verse, uh, verse 8. Say I these, thi these things as a man, or saith not the law, the Old Testament law, the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. I'll come back to that. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. He that ploweth shall plow in hope. He that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He goes back to the Old Testament law in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy gave a whole lot of different things about how they were supposed to do. And one of the things is, if you had some cattle and they were threshing out the grain, don't muzzle his mouth. In other words... If he's working for you and he needs something to eat, let him eat. 
In other words, it's not fair. Don't be so selfish with your stuff that you're not willing to help feed the ox that's getting the grain for you. So don't muzzle it. And then Paul says, is that just because God likes the ox and he wants to take care of him? No. It's a, it's a principle. And we, do, we should use that in employment. If you've got employees that work for you and they're making you money, you need to pay them well. That's, 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 that, that's that principle extended. And the Apostle Paul, God had generously blessed them as a church. Should not Paul have been able to have some of that to earn a living? However, what, ha okay, what, what happens if the, the ox takes too much? What happens if the ox is eating and eating and eating? Then you get another ox. <laughs> That's what you do. You get rid of that one, you have steak that night, and you get another ox. You know? And, and so what happens is he's saying, you know what? You need, you need to take care of the people, of the animals, of the things that are working for you. And at the very least, the Apostle Paul was working for the church in Corinth. He goes on. He says in verse, uh, verse 12. I kind of skipped verse 12, but I'll say to read it. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Notice, we haven't used this power. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He said, you know what? We, I could have. I could have come to you and said, hey, I need some financial help here, guys. I need to get away. I need some help. But he says, you know what? I had the power, but I chose not to use it. I had the authority. I had the right. As an apostle of human experience, of the Old Testament. And then look at here, it says verse 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things, the priests in the Old Testament, live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. The Old Testament priests, some of the people in Corinth were from were Jewish background, some of the Old Testament priests, this is what would happen. The priests did not have a job. In other words, they didn't earn a living. They didn't, they didn't plow anything. They didn't have oxen. They didn't have anything. What, what happens was they were the Lord's priests, and they were around the temple. And when everybody else had an offering, they would bring it to the Lord, and they would sacrifice some of it in the fire. Some of it they would eat as a family, as a group of people. And the rest of it the priests took as their own. The priests lived off of the offerings and the gifts of the other people. So that's what he's saying. He said even the Old Testament priests, that's what they did. As people gave, they were able to take part of that. And then he says, even the Lord Jesus said it. The Lord Jesus said that you should earn a living. When he sent out the 70, when he sent out the apostles and the other 70, he sent them away, and if you recall, I'm just going by your, a little bit of your memory in Matthew and Mark's gospel, he sent them out and he said, don't take any money. Do you, do you remember that? Don't take any money. You take your jacket, you take your cloak, you take your staff, and you go. And you live off of the generosity of God's people. If they accept you, you stay. Don't go looking for a better place. Whatever they give you, you take. In other words, you live off of the gifts of other people. Even Jesus taught that. That you should pay somebody, you should give somebody what's there. So here's the principle, and I know we're, this, is, this is Paul's lesson here, but let's look at this lesson. And, and it's, uh, I don't want it to be very personal, and it's not. I just want to teach you as a church. A church should take care of the pastor that they have. It's a little awkward to say that being the pastor of the church, you know? I mean, come on, you, you, gotta, admit, you gotta admit, this is a weird thing, okay? But it's not just for me, it's if you ever go anywhere else to another church, or if another person happens to be the pastor of this church, it is the obligation of a church to help take care of their pastor. And I will say this, very transparent. The church takes very good care of Judy and I. They do. We have people in the church, uh, I'm thinking of one right now, and they probably know who it is, that have been very instrumental in Judy and I being taken care of very well. We are not rich by any means. If you've seen my van that I drive around town, you know that I'm rich. We've got another one that we hide that we're saving uh, for when I retire. 
but we're not rich, but the church takes very good care of us, and I applaud the church. The church, this church, if you're not here, and I say, from, I say it from the pastor, this church is a very generous church. The church gives away a lot of help to missionaries. The church takes care of, and I think part of it has to do with taking care of the pastor. We're generous to guests that come in to speak for us, and I think that's important to if somebody's going to do something for us, and he says if, if they're doing it for spiritual things, we should at least give them something material. And that's an important aspect of this. But, but here's the deal, and this is why I'm not the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I had a right to receive wages from you, but I chose not to. I'm choosing to take wages from the church. <laughs> okay? Because I don't want to deliver papers. Okay, um, there, there's a reason I am, and that's a, I am able to devote a lot of time to serving in the church and preparing lessons and sermons and visiting and all that kind of thing because the church takes care of me. And let me let me just kind of say this this as well. I, the pastor is not an employee of the church. The pastor, in one sense, does not get paid by the church. The attitude is we provide for the pastor's needs so that he can serve the Lord unhindered. And that's what it is. How much ox should the ox eat? As much as he needs to take care of him, to do the work. You don't give him, have to give him any more, but make sure you feed him well so that he can do the work. And that's, that's what happens. The church gives me, gives me a house. The church takes care of the pastor's needs so that I don't have to worry about any of the financial part of my life. In one sense, I completely trust the Lord. But I'll tell you this, in another sense, I completely trust the church. If the church does not trust the pastor, then that person should not be the pastor of the church. You know? Uh, if the church thinks that a pastor is too greedy, is taking too much, is doing some things, that is not a pastor situation. That is a personal character situation. And so it's, it's, it's an awkward thing, but, but Paul, here, here's what happens. Paul is talking about the fact that, you know what? I had a right, but I chose not to. And this is, this, is, this is where it's getting at. The Corinthians had a right to eat meat that had been offered to idols. And I think what Paul is saying is, and, and what, what was, I think what was going on where they were saying, no, we want to eat meat. But these other people, they're acting like it's wrong. Paul, is it right or wrong? What should we do? And Paul says, well, when you get right down to it, there's nothing wrong with it. But you know what? Just because you can do it doesn't mean you ought to do it. As a matter of fact, I could take a wage from you guys. But I chose not to. And here's the reason. And that's what he's going to get into now. The reasons why he didn't, he had a right not to take the right, and that's kind of my point. The Christian has a right to give up rights. I don't have to, but you know what? I'm not going to. So the, here's what he says. Let's look here. First of all, for the gospel's sake. He chose not to take a wage for the gospel's sake. Look in verse 15. But I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things. I didn't even write you guys to send me anything. That it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, of necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For I, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He had the gospel and the preaching of the gospel committed to him. In verse 18. So what is my reward then? Very that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. He looked and he said, you know what? I could take, I could not take. What am I going to do? You know what? All I want to do is I want to preach the gospel. Whether they pay me or they don't pay me, I've got to preach the gospel. I have to. And so you know what? I'm going to go. And just in their day, there is in our day, sometimes people think that pastors are doing it for the money. And, and there's not any. But sometimes they do. And so Paul says, lest anyone should even think the wrong thing, I'm not going to do it. When I went to Bible college, they warned us about two things. Women... And money. 
Stay away from both of them. <laughs> and if you look at preachers that have messed up and have got out in the ministry, out of the ministry, you know that probably one of those two things was the cause of it. And I have been very, very cautious, me personally, on that. I just, I just because I know those two things, I'm done. I'll, I'll, have, I'll have to go sell newspapers, you know, or what, or, 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 and I'm not against selling newspapers, I just do that, but I, I have disqualified myself in the ministry. And so, so what happens is Paul says, you know what, I've looked this over and I have made a decision. I, I'm not going to take any money from you guys. I don't want you to think, I don't want you to, I just want you to know I'm doing it absolutely free, I'm completely, completely trusting the Lord. He was a tent maker. And so in one sense, and here's the deal though, the time that he could have spent preparing messages and visiting people, he had to spend making tents. He had to earn a living. It did cost him something in ministry, but you know what? He said, I, he said for the gospel's sake, I'm not going to do it. And that's one thing we need to think of ourselves is the, the rights and the wrongs, the things we choose to do and choose not to do, how will it affect the gospel? The message that I give out, would, would, would people wonder at the message that I tell them if I live this way. Our testimony. You see, more important than whether we get what we want to do is what the, when people see my life, what does that speak? We may have a right to do something or we may choose not to do something, but you know what? I got a world of people watching me that I got to be careful of. How does it affect the gospel? Will, will, it, will it extend the gospel even further? Or will it really curb the gospel from my life? He goes on, and for, he says, for the unbeliever's sake. And this goes into a little bit of what Karen just read. He says in verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. To the Jews... I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law to them that are without the law as without the law being not without law to God but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some and he goes back to the gospel this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. He says, you know what? I change my methods. Depending on where I'm at and who I'm with and what I do, I may do one thing in one city, I may do something in another city. And, and if we're not careful, we might look at that, look at that as somebody that's being kind of wishy-washy. You know? He's acting one way in front of the Jews, he's acting one way in front of the Gentiles. But he's doing it for the gospel's sake. It's kind of like a, a, a weather vane, you know, or a flag. You see a flag waving, and depending on which way the wind's blowing is depending on which way the flag is. And you might say, well, that flag doesn't have a mind of its own. No, it does. It, that flag does one thing. It always waves in the direction of the wind. And I think what Paul was saying is, you know what? I, I, I may not do everything, but you know one thing I do is I will do everything it takes short of sin, to reach people for Jesus Christ. There are a lot of unbelievers. And you know what? I may eat a hamburger with one guy, and I may eat a pork chop with somebody else, Jew and Gentile. I may eat meat that had been offered to idols with one family, and I may choose to not eat meat with another family. Because you know what? It really doesn't matter. But what does matter is I have people around me that don't know Jesus. Here's what always bothers me, and I've been in Christian work for a long time, and I've seen all of the disputes that Christians have amongst each other. Preacher that I got saved under, he used to say this. he say, here we are fussing and fighting over, and you name it. And he said, and out there is a world that's dying and going to hell. In other words, it is real easy for us to fuss and fight over, you do this, and I don't do this, and, and, and I'm better than you because I don't do that, and you do that. And that's nah, 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 nah. And we got a whole world that they don't even know about Jesus. And so what Paul is saying is, Paul is saying, you know what? I, I do. I do everything with an eye on the unbelievers that are around me. Because they are watching me. 
And there's a lot of things. I'll be on a personal level, and I won't give you some of the personal stuff, but there's a personal level that there's some things I would love to do. But I look around and say, you know what? I got people that are unsaved watching me. And I know I have a target on my back because I'm a pastor. And people look and people say, oh, you're a pastor. And you may not have that target on your back, but a lot of your friends and family know you're a Christian. And so you need to be very careful about what you do. You don't have to look down on them, and that's not what I'm saying at all. As a matter of fact, that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, is we need to have love and care for those people. So for the unbeliever's sake. And then I love, I love this part. For our own sake, for his, for his own sake. It wasn't just for God and the gospel. It wasn't just for uh, the unbelievers that are around him. Paul had some personal skin in this. Because Paul had given up what he could have rightfully taken. There was something that Paul was going to benefit from it. And we can too. Look in verse 24. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. One gets first place. So run that you may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. And they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not, not as one that beats the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He uses this whole running idea. And he says, you know, you run in a race and, and you got all these people running and you know, one gets the prize. He says, you need to run so that you can win. So that you can win the race. And let's think about, let's think about athletes. Some of you that are athletes, some of you that were athletes, some of you that don't even get athletes, you do know this, that when you're an athlete, there's some things that you choose to do and some things you choose not to do. I was down here talking to this young football player. Athletes right now in the summertime are going out in this hot weather and they're doing training. That's crazy, Okay. That's crazy. It's 90 degrees. Why are they doing that? So they can win some football games. So they can be the best. So they can be first string. So that when the, when the announcer calls out the starting lineup, their name is in that. Why are they doing it? They're doing it for something that is temporary. But they're doing it. They don't eat whatever they want. They don't eat candy bars and pop and stuff like that. You know what? They know that whatever they eat is fuel. And if they eat the right kind of stuff, it's going to build muscle. If they eat the wrong kind of stuff, that's going to slow them down. So they are very careful to eat what they ought to eat. You know? And we can say, you know what? They don't have to go to practice. No, they don't have to go to practice. They don't have to not drink pop, and they don't have to eat meat, and they drink protein drinks, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. They don't have to do that. You know? But you know why they do it? It's because they want to win. My sermon title, Whatever It Takes to Get This Body in Shape to win the race, to win the game. I will do whatever it takes. And Paul then takes that and translates it to our spiritual life. Because he says they do it for something that's temporary. Paul was talking to the people in Corinth. And back in those days were the original Olympic Games held every four years. But in the city of Corinth was the second biggest games. It was called the uh, Appian Games or something like that. I'll get it in a minute. And they had it the year before and the year after the Olympics. And what ended up happening is these guys would come out, and they knew that. They knew what these athletes were like. And Paul says they do it for a temporary. They did it for a wreath around their head. They didn't even do it for a gold medal. Do you know, do you know we have Schroeder boys, Schroeder boys, wrestlers. Why, do they, why, did, why did they wrestle? Why did they not go to the parties and do some of the stuff that other people did so they could be a wrestler? You know why? So they could be a champion. And it's not, it's not for the trinkets. It's not for the stuff you get. And you talk even to professional athletes. It's not even for the money you get. It's for the applause. It's for the recognition. And I think what Paul is saying here is he's saying, I'm not doing it for the temporary recognition of man. I am doing it for the recognition of one. And that is when I stand before Jesus and he looks at what I've done, he will simply say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
If you've have, ever had to perform in anything in front of your parents, you know what that is like to see the pride on their face when you have done something. There's nothing to compare with that. To look in the stands and see your dad. Mike Matheny was a good friend of mine. He now is the coach of the uh, uh, St. Louis Cardinals. And Mike wrote a book. And in a book he said, my dad never said anything or yelled anything, but my dad had this whistle. And my dad would whistle whenever I did something right or something like that. And he says, I'd be out there on the ball field and I would all of a sudden do something. I'd hear that whistle. He said, I knew that was my dad. And he said, and, and, and that's what, but you know what? We're not doing it for something temporary. It is something that is permanent. It is eternal. And what Paul says is, you know what? Hey, I'm not going to, if, if eating meat or not eating meat, whatever I, whatever, whatever it takes, I'm not going to, because I'm not doing it for anything else. He says, so that I wouldn't be a castaway. And that word is unique. That castaway means somebody that is disqualified. And we've all seen people that have, that have uh, played a game, and then after the game is over, they found out that they did something wrong. They stepped out of bounds, or they were on steroids, or something like that, and their medal, their place of honor was taken away from them. That's the term that is used. And Paul says, I don't want to get to heaven and do all this work and find out that, you know what, I didn't do it for the right reasons. I am self-disciplined. That, you know what, even though I want to, I'm not going to. Even though I can, I'm not going to. And that, I think that's the hard part. You know what, it is a lot easier to just live life open and do whatever you want to do than it is to try to live a strict, disciplined life to serve Jesus the best you can and not do everything you can but to do it for Jesus. So here's my two closing points and you don't have them in your outline. So these are extras. This is a bonus, okay? This is a bonus. Number one, Christians are not to build walls to keep unbelievers away but bridges to cross over to Jesus. We have this tendency that when people are doing things that we, shouldn't, we don't want to do or whatever it is, that we're trying to build up walls. We're better than they are. We don't do that. I don't, I don't care what that person is doing or what they're like. Our job is not to build a wall between us and them. Jesus came to build a bridge, and our job is to connect with them. So whatever I do, if it is keeping me away from people that are not Christians, I'm not going to get involved in that. Or lost people, not Christians. Christians too. I grew up in a church. And I, I understand a whole separate from unbelievers kind of a thing. That's more in practice than it is in anything else. But we were told to keep away in this little group. And we're not going to be able to participate. Jesus wants us to get out into the world to let our light shine so men may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We are to be bridge builders to people that are not Christians. But the last one is this, last principle, and that is to receive the reward, you must pay the price. I've said it before, you know why I don't play, I'm not good, you know why I'm not a good piano player? I don't want to practice. Just don't want to practice, Okay. If you want to be good at something, you've got to pay the price. If you, if, if you want anything in life, okay, we live in a world where everybody gets a ribbon just for participating, and nobody's a loser. And that's the way, the, I'll step down, that's the way we're training our kids. It's all okay. That's not the way the real world works. The real world works. If you want something, you got to work for it. That's, I'm, so, I'm sorry, kids. That's the way it works. Okay? And if you want something from the Lord, you got to be willing to pay the price. And I think that's why you are as strong of a Christian as you really want to be. You're as close to Jesus as you really want to be. Sometimes we just don't want to pay the price. I don't want to get up early enough to pray. I don't want to take time out of my busy schedule to read God's word. I don't have time to go to church to be with other Christians and encourage them and receive the, er the encouragement from them. I got things to do. You know what? Everybody has things. We all have 24 hours a day. Nobody has extra time. We're all busy. You make time to do what's important to you. This week we've been just enamored with this rescue mission of the Thailand 
young boys soccer team. Do you see that? I, that is just the coolest thing. These young kids got stuck in a cave and the water around them and they had days and these divers were going down trying to give them oxygen and try to give them food and take care of them. One man ended up dying in the rescue mission, but they got all the soccer team and the coaches out. And we were just fascinated with that rescue. But why? What, you know, sometimes you think, why all, this, why all this time and money and energy and lives spent? Why? Because those little kids were worth it. If that was your son or daughter at the bottom of that cave, you would say, whatever it takes to get them out, do it. It's been 30 years. How many of you remember baby Jessica? Yeah, it, it's, it's in my brain. There's a little 18-month-old girl that fell in an abandoned oil well down in Texas. Remember that? And the whole country was like, Phew. and they were trying to get her out because she was stuck down in that well. And they got her out. And she's now... You know, it's been 30, it's been 30 years, 30, 31 years this year. And she's out and she's down. But, but why did that get us? Because of the rescue. God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the greatest rescue ever. Jesus sacrificed everything so that you could spend forever with him. And he has offered it to you absolutely free. You couldn't pay for it if you had the money. You couldn't pay for it if you spent the rest of your life owing it to him. But he is giving it to you as a gift. And if you will receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, he will forgive you of all of your sin, he will bring you into his family, and he will rescue you. But I just got to say to the other, if you don't want it, if you don't want Jesus, he is a gentleman, he will let you live your life. But you will pay for your sin for all eternity in a place that is abandoned by God and there is no hope, hell. But you have this opportunity now. When we get to heaven, I am sure we will say, I wish I would have done more. If you ever end up in hell, you will forever remember this day and wish you would have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is so simple, but it's your decision. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Whatever it takes, Paul said, whatever it takes, I'm willing to share the gospel. Whatever it takes, I'll say yes, I'll say no. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to reach your neighbors? Whatever it takes. As a Christian, what is your testimony like to those that are around you? Is it a little bit more selfish and you do whatever you want to do? I don't want to bring it up. They might feel awkward. I'd rather be awkward than not knowing exactly where they're going to spend eternity. Maybe God has you in this strategic relationship in this place in your life so that you can be a witness to them. Whatever it takes, Paul was willing to do. Come and pray for them. If you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm giving you a message of hope right now. That message will not always be hope. When we stand before God, our fate is sealed. Today is a day of salvation. Don't put it off another day. Trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Turn to him. Ask him to forgive you of your sin and be your Lord and Savior. Barb's going to play through a song here in a few minutes. I would just encourage you to pray for your neighbors, whatever it takes to reach them, your friends, your family. And if you don't know Jesus, come and receive Jesus as your personal Savior. I'll be down here in the front if you need any help. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. He, he went on the greatest rescue mission ever. And it is available to all of us because all of us are stuck in a cave. And until Jesus comes to deliver us, we are doomed. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to rescue others. And if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus, may you rescue them today. We pray in his name. Amen.